Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, it is November 5th, 2015, and you have tuned in to the Co-Creators Convergence first Thursday night call of the month. And we are so pleased that you are here, and we're so pleased to have those that will be listening to this recording at a later date um, to be a part of the energetic circle that is we. Um, the um, Co-Creators Convergence is a group of evolutionary souls that are dedicated to co-creating a new humanity inspired by such visionaries as Buckminster Fuller and Barbara Marks Hubbard and the um, pure source that is each and every one of us. And it is our intention to spend this time together and in many other ways connect with each other energetically and in person through the course of the year so that we can be a part in deepening into this emerging, con emerging consciousness um, and to bring this understanding, this awakened state, back to our everyday life in the practical 3D world that we walk in. Uh, wonderful to have everyone here this evening and uh, hand the magic talking stick back to my beloved Noelle Marshall. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. And, Bob, that was just a beautiful... Uh, inspiring. I'm, I'm really glad I showed up for this call. Oh, well, good. I'm glad you're here, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just really feel welcomed, and uh, we're going to um, have a conversation with one of our uh, beloved members, Dr. Donald Pett. Today we're going to hear a lot about what um, our beloved Donald Pett has co-created and how he's dedicated his, you know, truly so much of his teachings um, uh, for his whole life and now culminating in the gifts that he's giving to us uh, in so many different modalities. And um, his topic he's going to be sharing with us tonight is Einstein's solution to happiness, love, and peace. I didn't see any special equations here, so I'm sure Donna's going to fill us in on those. But what he'd like to do is... Um, Teach us the seven simple word changes, an Einstein solution to world peace, and the two most powerful, it's still secret skills, that teach the golden rule. So uh, Don, he uh, in, um, has quite a, uh, a long career as uh, uh, he'll tell us about his medical background and teaching um, at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, working with so many patients as a psychiatrist, but he really is focused now, and I see that he is uh, likes the tag peace authority. So he is going to be sharing with us now about uh, a formula that he's come up with, uh, which we call the 7 plus 2 formula. So, Don, before we begin into your formula, I just want to, I know that a lot of our uh, callers are familiar with you, but uh, there are some that are new, and so I'd like to just give us a, a, uh, some background about Donald Pett and um, uh, what your career has been and, and what, what brought you down this path that, that you're now on. Would you mind doing that, Don? Sure, that'd be my pleasure. And Thank you all for, for joining the group here, and uh, I, I hope you're going to walk away with something very special. My goal is to teach you the quickest and fastest, most effective and enjoyable way to learn to love yourself with abundance that overflows to enrich the world. It's really quite simple, and unfortunately we have lots of people who preach these skills, but there's very few places where you can go to actually take a course and skills in loving yourself. If you're fortunate to have uh, uh, role models, uh, that's one way we learn. It's much more difficult just to discover these skills on your own. Uh, but they're they're really quite easily to teach, easy to teach, and that's what I hope to share with you in our meeting today. Uh, my background is that I, I was always interested in, in what, as I think we all are, and how what can we do to make the world a happier, better place for for everyone. I think that's built into us. We love being able to do things that benefit other people. That's part of what I think our purpose is. Uh, and uh, in my uh, training at Johns Hopkins in psychiatry, I was very fortunate that my uh, favorite uh, mentor and professor then and thereafter was Jerome Frank, and he was at that time the world authority 
on the causes of peace, the causes of war. He wrote a seminal book uh, uh, on the topic. He was asked to testify before Congress several times, and uh, so he was inspirational. And I've always been interested in gathering from the opportunity to meet with thousands of individuals uh, in my psychiatric career what really works for them, what gets them to to, uh, to uh, attain a, a fulfilling, happy life experience. So I've collected those skills, put them together, and now I'm ready to put, publish those in a book. And they're all online, and we'll give you the websites later. But everything I do is free, and it's totally non-commercial. And my goal is to recruit one million love creation teachers who, through the domino effect, can uh, pass this on to other individuals if it's free and, it's, and it gives it quick results as I hope you'll find tonight, then uh, that it will be easy and, and you will enjoy becoming a love creation teacher. I'll explain exactly how one can do that. So that's part of my background, and I've been spending a lot of time with my uh, websites. I've been uh, invited to teach a course at Central Connecticut State University on the topic, and uh, we've had very good reception, and, uh, uh, and soon the book will come out. But most of these skills are available free on the Internet, and everything is in the public domain. So anything that you can use in any of your personal life to pass this on to other people, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, as I say, everything is free, and please be happy, please to use any of the information. Now, the uh, now the, the one of the issues is that we live in a, a dangerous world today. Uh, as an, I, I consider myself, based on my, my experience and involvement over a long time, an expert on the causes of peace. And one of the things that people who are most knowledgeable will tell us we have probably 10 years or less to get our act together. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the introduction of, and popularization or, or spread of weapons of all, what I call weapons of ultimate destruction are so powerful that they offer no second chance. Uh, we've always, in our history, we've always had a situation where we've, we've uh, expressed our anger with, with teeth or fists or, or sticks and stones and bows and arrows and, and bullets, even bombs that kill a few at a time. But usually both sides survive, and, uh, and, that's, the, and that's the end of the conflict for a while. And when you think about it, the, the cause of peace in the history has been war. Uh, it seems kind of funny to say it that way, but uh, when people have disagreements, usually because of economic differences or religious or values differences, uh, they go to war, they fight, and there's a winner and a loser. Usually some people die, but both sides survive, and after the war, there's, there's peace for a long period of time until the losing group becomes strong enough that they, they stage another war. So our whole history has been a series of wars. Uh, and what's different in today's world is that the weapons we have that are so powerful uh, that it, it's, it's hard for us even to imagine the, uh, the amount of, uh, of nuclear weapons on re ready release status uh, is the equivalent of about 70,000 70, uh, 70, of the Nagasaki Hiroshima type bombs. And uh, if, uh, if anyone is set off, uh, it will require that the, uh, the opposite side to re release their weapons. So we know that the next war, if it occurs, will start in about 10 minutes, and it will be over in about 10 minutes. And there will be nothing left. As it said in Nagasaki, the thing that struck me with a lot of passion, the description, people were walking about, they were taking their kids to school, they were going to business, they were doing their shopping. All of a sudden there was a flash of light, and then there was nothing. You know, the bombs just make people disappear. You've just, they fried it to zero. And, and the only way we can deal with that is prevention. So unless we, we take some steps, then we're going to be, uh, we're going to, it's only a matter of time before uh, either one person or a, uh, or a misjudgment or even a mechanical error. You know, these are, all these weapons are set off, are set so that, that they could be released uh, all at once uh, by a signal which could even be a mechanical error. So it's rather frightening, and we've had many situations already that are documented where the planes have already been loaded, they've been in the air, they've had been nuclear armed, and at the last minute they were called back. Most people aren't aware of that, but there are a number of incidents where we've had such situations. 
So we're close to this this uh, Nagasaki experience where everybody's just doing their normal thing, and all of a sudden a flash of light, and we're not here anymore. And we we care enough for our loved ones that we want to make some change. Now Einstein told us that the one way we can create world peace is to teach ourselves a newer way of thinking. Uh, he told us also the formula for E equals M C squared. He was one of his interests was energy, and. Uh, when he discovered the formula E equals MC squared, he realized that it had the potency for the nuclear weapon. He didn't want to share it with anyone, but uh, when when his colleagues uh, told him that if he didn't let our president be aware of this, uh, Hitler might get developed the bomb first. And when he realized that that was the other alternative possibility, even though he was a pacifist, uh, he wrote the letter to uh, to Truman that led to the Manhattan Project and, of course, the first bomb. Uh, but he also told us the, the solution, and he said it's uh, a newer, we have to teach ourselves a newer way of thinking. And the fastest way we can do that is the, what I'm calling the 7 plus 2 formula. There are seven simple word changes, very simple word changes that anyone can learn, and that's what I'm going to go over with you very quickly in about less than 10 minutes is all it takes, and then with another four or five minutes, I want to share with you the two most powerful, yet still secret, love creation skills that anyone can learn so that we can love ourselves with the abundance that overflows to enrich others. And that, when you think about it, is a new version of the golden rule. So let's start then with the seven word switches. The first one is when we substitute the word, I think I can, for why bother, what's the use, the hell with it, uh, it's too hard, fuck it. These are the common things that we tell ourselves that we shut down our energy factory. So when we when we don't really address an issue, we're not going to solve it. And unfortunately, we have acquired a helpless, hopeless response. I personally have interviewed over 200 individuals with short video slips, uh, uh, short video uh, uh, interviews. And uh, to the question, do you ever wish or pray for world peace? Uh, it's unanimous. Everybody says, yes, I do wish or pray for world peace. Or say they wish for world peace and pray for world peace. Some do both, but there are quite a few of both. But people don't say, no, I'm against world peace. Uh, the next question is, what do you do to bring about world peace? And most people say, I don't do anything. Some say, you yeah, know, they have a few things they do. They, they, they try to be kind to other people or they try to support some of the, the second or third world countries and so on. But for the most part, they say they don't do anything. And why do they not do anything? There are several common reasons, but the most common is, well, there's nothing that one person can do that would make any difference. It's a false idea, but that's what most people think. And uh, this is called in psychology the helpless, hopeless response. If you shut down your energy, then you're not obviously not going to do anything. You're going to be dealing with other issues. So the first the word change is a very simple one. We need to turn our energy back on. My favorite story as a uh, as a child was the little engine that could. If you remember that story, the the the, the big engines were were too proud and too too busy to take the toys over the hill to the children for for Christmas, and they finally went to the little engine who'd never been over the hill, and he said, "Gee, I've never done that. I don't think I can do it." But he he started to say, "I think I can. I think I can. I think I can," and he turned his energy on. He got over the hill. And that's basically the first step. We have to say we can do something. The hopeful thing about the interviews that I've made with over 200 people is that virtually all of them, when you ask them the next question, if someone told you what you could do that made sense, would you do something? And they, most of them say, of course I would. But, but, but you have to be aware of something that you can do that makes sense. So the 7 plus 2 formula, in my opinion, is the most likely, most powerful thing we can do right now, starting with turning our energy back on, realizing that we can. Now, the second word switch is I allow. Instead of they make me, we substitute the word I allow. This is a word that takes responsibility for ourselves. You know, Jack Canfield has sold over 500 million books, uh, and there must be a reason because people think he's got a message. And his basic, basic message throughout all of these books is you've got to take responsibility for yourself. Unless you begin to, to uh, say it's something that I can do 
instead of what most people do is they, we get stuck in what we learn as children. We learn to blame other people. We learn to blame others. We learn to blame ourselves. So the reason we have war and conflict is because when we get frustrated, our biologic response is to look for someone or something to strike out. Uh, we get angry and we get into, you all know what road, road rage is and so on. We've seen examples of that. And we're seeing so many examples of the shooters in school and so on. They get upset and before you know it, they're ready to attack and kill other people. And unfortunately, that's been our history, the history of wars. When people are unhappy with something, they usually want to find somebody to blame. So I allow is a very powerful word. It says, yes, I take responsibility it gets rid of the blaming response, which is the most common response to frustration and stress. So that's word switch number two. Number three is we substitute I could for I should. Should is one of those words that we learn as children of somebody else's idea of what's right and what's wrong. We all grow up with big should words, and we learn to uh, say that instead of directing anger to others, we're also taught to direct it at ourselves. We call that guilt when we direct our anger and energy toward ourselves. We put ourselves down. We blame ourselves. So one of the most common biologic responses is to blame others, and only humans, as far as I can tell, do a very good job of, of, of guilting ourselves. As uh, Albert Ellis, a very well-known uh, therapist, said, uh, we spend a lot of time shooting on ourselves. And, of course, that gets us in a lot of difficulty. So the third word is a very simple switch, I could for I should. So far, pretty easy, isn't it? Three simple word switches. I think I can, I allow, I could. The next word switch is one of the most important. We substitute both and or either or. You know, the way we think biologically... This is one of the really important concepts. The way we all think biologically is the way that we were programmed for billions of years, for over a billion years. We see this in, in, uh, in animals. We see this in our ancestors for a very good reason, because it was normal and sane to think of the world in two categories. Our ancestors lived on two separate hills and there was a limited amount of food in the middle of those two hills. So in order to survive, you had to be a part of a tribe. You had to be a part of a group. No one could really survive independently. So there was strength in numbers, so we developed tribes. We see this in flocks. We see it in herds and animals. We see the fights between the red ants and the black ants, and we see it in virtually every, every, uh, every form of animal and so on. But we, our answers had to do the same. They lived on separate hills, and they had limited resources. There, there weren't markets that you could go and do your shopping, so you had to go to bed at night deciding, what could I kill the next day? Uh, and uh, in order to survive, they had to compete and consider the world in two categories. It's either my way or the other way. So... Here's the one sentence that is the root cause of war. We, we, can, we can identify that. Let's keep all this as simple as we can. I know everybody likes to keep things simple. But the one sentence that is the reason we have war can be summarized as, my way is the only right way. Uh, and that's the either-or response. So we're all born with the idea. And then from the time we're, we're, we're born, when we're programmed to think in terms of being in a tribe and having allegiance to our tribe, then we're given a vocabulary of words that even more directs us to either or thinking. So just about everyone gets a, uh, a uh, patriotic symbol, a flag. Everyone is given a religious symbol. And most everyone, not as many as uh, the patriotic or religious symbols, but most people are given a political symbol. And these symbols, if you think about it, they are device of symbols, they divide the world into two different categories. So we learn to think in terms of either or. It's my way or the wrong way. And we also grow up with the idea that might is right and survival of the fittest. These were not only uh, normal, but they, they made a lot of sense. Uh, if we didn't have that kind of an attitude uh, for our ancestors, we would not have survived. We would have had to be involved in 
in uh, being part of a tribe and thinking in two categories. Well, that was fine until the in, in introduction of weapons of mass destruction, when we no, no, no longer can have a winner and loser where everybody is going to be a loser. So I think that was part of the basis of Einstein's idea. We have to teach ourselves a newer way of thinking. Instead of both and, we substitute, instead of rather either or, we substitute both and. So it's not uh, just my way is the only way. The new, the new what sentence is, what will make things better for me and you, or my tribe and your tribe, for now and the future? That is a, a marvelous sentence when you think about it, because it doesn't blame anyone. It simply says, how can we work together to find a solution? Another way of looking at that most powerful sentence, what will make things better for me and you, or my tribe and your tribe, for now and the future, that's also the modern expression of the golden rule. So that's, that is the fifth word change. Instead of my way is the only way, the, uh, the golden rule sentence, I call it the magical sentence because it always works so well. What will make things better for me and you, for my tribe and your tribe? Uh, and we're talking about for now and the future. We're not just talking about for this moment. So that's the fifth word change. Now the sixth one and the seventh one go together because all of us have this built-in fight or flight response. And the fight or flight response is better known to us as anger, anger leading to fight, and anxiety leading to flight. So we're all built into, as our ancestors had to do, to either fight or run. This is the way animals respond. We all have this, all have this very powerful fight or flight response. So the sixth word change is a very simple one. We substitute energy for anger or anxiety. Anger is the primitive fight response, uh, and, and, and anxiety is the primitive flight response and fear. So what energy does is it tells us that this reaction that we have, this automatic fight or flight reaction, instead of thinking of it as something that we have to immediately act on, as our ancestors did, we think of it as energy. Energy tells us that we have the, the opportunity to do something now. If energy says we can think about these things and direct our energy to do something creative, that's really the purpose of energy when you think about it. And when you look at the word love, all that love is in one way is the direction of our energy for the benefit of someone else or ourselves. Uh, so I think Einstein was right when he was interested in energy equals mc squared, but, in, but he talked about it in terms of explosive power. But energy is also our, the direction of love to do something positive. Okay, now the seventh word switch is when we take the word, uh, when we take the word, emergency, and we substitute urgent instead of emergency. Most people get into difficulty because they uh, deal with things in their life as emergencies. Uh, that's what road rage is all about. Years ago, I was invited by the Commissioner of Mental Health and the Commissioner of Corrections in the state of Connecticut to go visit people in our most uh, advanced or most uh, long-term correctional institution. And we interviewed people who had life sentences uh, and very long sentences. And what surprised me is that many of the individuals who had these long sentences were not career criminals. They didn't have long records, but they were involved in a situation of rage where they got a gun or they got a knife and they did something that was irreversible and they got these long sentences. So we have this built-in response that we that we that was necessary for our ancestors, and it's still part of our biology to want to react to things instantly. So the simple substitute here, instead of when we think of an emergency or we think we're having an emergency, to label it, relabel it urgent, and then give it a priority. So we take the word urgent and we say, is this high, medium, or low priority? And in virtually every instance, we'll find that, in reality, what we're dealing with today is very low priority. There are very few things that we have to do right away without thinking about them and coming up with a solution. But we tend to deal with things 
overreact and we, we think that just because we become aroused, we have this automatic arousal response, we, we think of them as we have to either bite and fight or run avoidance or else we get involved in some kind of uh, situation where we deal with it as an emergency and, and we don't do so well. So those are the simple, simple seven word switches. Now, what about the two part of the formula? I promise you I'd offer you two secret love creation skills that anyone can learn very rapidly. Now, the first one I'm calling emotional self-endorsement. Emotional self-endorsement. If you think about it, uh, we engage in emotional endorsement regularly, don't we? We know how to... Uh, go to a sports or athletic event, we stomp our feet on the ground, and we clap and we yell and we shout. We become quite abandoned in our reserve. When we go to a musical event, we, we applaud. Uh, we, we shout sometimes, we stand up, uh, and if sometimes we have tears depending on what the nature of the performance. We all know how to talk to an infant to get that infant to smile, don't we? And we know how to talk to a dog to get that dog to shake its behind and wag its tail. We do it with enthusiasm. The question I have for you is, how often do you act to yourself in the same enthusiastic, emotional way? When was the last time you got up in the morning, looked in the mirror, and said, I am such a hot sketch. I really like myself. When do we really take the time to really emotionally pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves credit? I recall a number of situations in my private practice, I'll just mention one of them, where one of my patients was telling me he he has, was very proud of a software program he had made and he was sharing that with his friend. His mother came over, pulled him aside and said, you know, John, you should never talk like that to your friend because that's bragging. And you know that that's egotistical and self-centered. And her last statement was, uh, you know, love only counts, or love approval only counts if it comes from someone else. Well, that's the way we're mostly brought up as a child. You know, we don't have the ability to emotionally endorse ourselves. We are totally dependent for at least a decade and more than that, usually maybe two decades, to depend on what somebody else uh, does to give us self-worth. And that's one of the problems we have in this in this situation. We don't know how to emotionally endorse ourselves, create our own self-esteem. We go through life depending on other people. So here's a very simple thing. We just teach ourselves the skills of emotionally endorsing ourselves. It may be difficult at first because our society usually says if you do that, you're self-centered, you're egotistical, and it's wrong. But uh, I think that's that's one of the problems we have that our society has taught us uh, to not only to not endorse, uh, to they haven't taught us how to endorse ourselves emotionally, they have taught us not to endorse ourselves emotionally. So here's a very simple skill when you can practice in the morning. You can practice any time during the day. Uh, how many times can, do you give yourself pats on the back and some emotional enthusiasm? Uh, it may take 20 or 30 or 40 instances a day. And uh, it's easy enough to do that. We can do it when we brush our teeth. We can do it when we go to bed at night. We can do it when we sit down for for a meal or set up a regular time. But people find when they start emotionally, emotionally endorsing themselves, they begin to feel better about themselves. They develop their self-esteem and confidence, and it's one of the most important things we can do. And now for the second part of the, uh, of the secret love creation skill, it's what I call the reasonable best measure of self-worth. Also a very simple skill. Most people go through life depending on their approval from other people. And they feel that they have to meet other people's expectation. Uh, and often, people are not very generous in giving people approval. Uh, so uh, we, we feel we have to, our educational system is set up so that some people get A's, some people get B's, some people flunk. So we, we, we essentially say to people, some people are okay or good and others are failures. And of course, the people who are failures begin to get uh, withdrawal from their environment, and uh, that's where we have shooters in the school, we have difficulty. But the, the basic skill would be uh, to learn to do our reasonable best 
instead of our absolute best and to realize that we can always do our reasonable best. Uh, there's no situation where we're not able to take control of our own self-esteem. But if we're depending on others, so what do happens when, what do people do when they, when they uh, depend on other individuals? Uh, most people depend on their worth by the outcome of what they do. These are here, listen to these outcome measures. I'm okay if he or she loves me. I'm okay if I won. I'm okay if my efforts worked out. I'm okay if they accept me. I'm okay if I got an A. I'm okay if my salary is increased or the audience applauds or if you understand. I'm okay if they think I'm attractive or if I own a whatever it is, a car or a special something or other. I'm okay. I'm okay if our kids are doing well. I'm okay if I didn't make a mistake. See, all these are the kind of things we learned to depend on our self-worth. And as uh, an example I've given in some of my writings is, well, as one individual said, I, I thought about counting the number of approvals I got during the day, and I realized if I was waiting for other people to approve me every day, I would never feel good about myself until I realized that I could start uh, endorsing myself for doing my reasonable best. So here's a simple thing. When you realize you're doing your reasonable best, you go back to the first skill and emotionally endorse yourself. You want to make the skill of emotionally endorsing yourself occur very rapidly and easily? Here's the secret of doing that. Here's a very nice way of turbocharging, making your self-worth come up very rapidly. Behavior that's rewarded is repeated. That's the first thing we learn in psychology, in Psychology 101. Behavior that's rewarded is repeated. So try this skill. When you endorse yourself, try secondary endorsement. What is secondary endorsement? Secondary endorsement is endorsing yourself or endorsing yourself. If endorsing yourself is one of the most powerful, effective things you can do to create love, create an abundance of love, and you're doing that, then why not endorse yourself because you're doing something great like endorsing yourself? If you develop secondary endorsement, that skill will develop very, very rapidly. And most people, within 30 days, can develop the skills of really emotionally endorsing and loving themselves as an automatic and effortless behavior. Instead of the usual automatic effortless behavior, we've learned as kids, we've learned to put ourselves down. We have words like put-downs and setbacks, but in our language, we don't even have many words like a pull-up or set-forward that our language, you see, is already shaped against us. So let's get back to the reasonable best measure now. Uh, what if you find you're not being doing your reasonable best measure? You say, gee, you know, I really could have done better. What do most people say to themselves when they find they're not doing their reasonable best? They say, oh, I'm so stupid, I should have done better. I should have done something different. So most people put themselves down and when they find they're not doing their reasonable best. But when we think about it, that doesn't really make too much sense. Because when we put ourselves down, uh, it doesn't lead to anywhere. It doesn't make anything constructive. It just makes us feel bad. It doesn't solve any problem. But if instead, when we say to ourselves, you know, I'm realizing I'm not doing my reasonable best, it's only because I'm aware of it and I'm realizing it that I can do something to change it. So when I become aware that I'm not doing my reasonable best, instead of putting myself down, I deserve a pull-up. I deserve a pull-up because it's only when I'm aware I'm not putting myself down that I can start pulling myself up. So you see, each time we have a, we have a shortcoming, that becomes an opportunity to learn. So we create a win-win situation. If we're doing our reasonable best, we win. If we realize we're, putting our, we're not doing our reasonable best, we endorse ourselves for that and we create a win-win situation. That's 100% in our control. Now, how often are these other measures in our control when we depend on the outcome of what we do? Uh, many people get upset because the stock market goes down, because it rains uh, and it's not a sunny day, uh, because they, their, hair point, uh, their hair appointment was canceled or because their favorite basketball team lost. Uh, these are the kind of things you see that we all get caught up in 
and I'm, I'm sure you can all relate to that, is the kind of things that we let regulate our mood rather than the first step we mentioned, take responsibility for yourself. Begin to tell yourself, I allow, instead of it, he, she, they, or God makes me. Okay, so that's the 7 plus 2 formula. And you see how easy it would be? We could teach ourselves these skills. We could teach our kids. Uh, we, we, gotta, we could start with ourselves. Uh, and it doesn't require money. You don't have to have unusual intelligence. It doesn't. You can even be in poor health, and you can still acquire these skills. And I've seen them work over and over again. But instead, we we sort of go through life, kind of depending on others. But we we have a way of thinking that I think uh, tends to still divide the world into two categories. As a matter of fact, I've tried in the book that I'll be coming out with soon. I've named this as a disease, as a as a disease that is more powerful more deadly than cancer, AIDS, or the Black Plague. Because either we're thinking uh, that divides us into two categories and eventually leads to war as a way to cause peace uh, is no longer acceptable when we have weapons with ultimate destructive power. In the past, we could always our ancestors could always survive this way. But now this has become a, a deadly disease, and, this, and there's no prevention against these weapons. There's, there's, there's rather, there's no, there's no defense against these weapons. The only way we can deal with them is by prevention, and we're not too good at prevention. We, we usually have a motto of war and cure. And cure. So that's the basic idea. And I, I just want to introduce one other thing. And I, I'd really like to hear some of your thoughts. And uh, I know I've been uh, running on here, but I wanted to try to get these seven plus two skills across to you. And, and uh, they're also available on the internet. You can just I'll go to www.7plus2formula, www.7plus2formula, and, and these are written out. Soon we're going to have a, a, a video of these, of these skills. And uh, we have another, um, the, more, the, the larger content is available at www.lovingmenow.org. We are a nonprofit uh, organization. Everything is totally free, non-commercial, and you're welcome to pass any of these things on. I just wanted to comment on something that recently occurred in the news that I found very interesting. Uh, maybe you've heard that recently it was discovered that in Egypt uh, they discovered the seven uh, burial grounds for seven, seven million mummified uh, cats and dogs. Seven million. That apparently 500 years B.C. it was sort of a religious or ceremonial thing that if individuals uh, mummified uh, an animal and, uh, and dedicated it to a higher God, they would be received in, a, in an afterlife in a better way. And it became a, a commercial activity. People were raising dogs and cats to be mummified, and it was a major occupation, apparently, for people to sell these, these, uh, these animals. Uh, and we look at that as a kind of a... Uh, kind of a uh, it's not something we would, would make so much as much uh, sanity uh, when we think about it using our higher brain these days. But think about you know what we've been doing now. We, we we kind of have the same idea in some way. We feel that in order to in order to to get ourselves to heaven or to get to a better afterlife, we have to cut off people's heads. We have to engage in war and so on. So you see what used to be normal and sane has now become normal but insane still normal to have these ideas of fight or flight and so on but now when we act on it in the today's world we've got to wake up and change our way of thinking so that's just an introduction and just a short time that we've had and, and I, I think maybe bob and noel I, I welcome your your comments i'm sure you have some thoughts about these things and we have some people on the line that would love to hear what their ideas are whether any of this makes sense, whether they have a better idea, always looking to find the better ways of doing things. Okay. Uh, thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Um, let me see. First thing I want to clarify is the website, because we just tried to do a 7 plus 2 formula uh, website and didn't find it. Is that one up now? It should be up, and, it's, and it can be... It can be the 7 plusformulaorg the 7 plusformulacom or just 7 plus formula. But you have to put in P-L-U-S because the Internet will not take a plus sign. Okay. 
Did you put in PLUS or did you put in a plus sign? We put in PLUS. We put the number 7 PLUS 2. Okay, it should should come up as a as a written narrative. Okay. okay. Uh well, we'll keep googling that, but um you know, um how how recent um have you formulated all this and what has been your experience? You know, I could say that, you know, I uh, you know, love your thought process on this, but uh, and I'm wondering how you, you know we've we've all evolved certainly you know, along a path, and you know just put a uh, you know piece of paper and say this is the the way to do it. You know how do you actually actualize that, integrate that, uh, practice that? Um, you know, to get it on a scale that will uh, change our trajectory, if you will. Well, we forget how powerful words are. You know, our ancestors invented language 50,000 years ago, but the words we invented are words that are they support our animal brain, which is limited and, uh, and it's fairly mechanical. Our five senses of our animal brain can only see superficially and local here and now. So the words in our language, as Margaret Mead pointed out years ago, is the main reason we have wars and we, we, we are, we've become our own worst enemy. We have words like setback, uh, and we have words like uh, uh, put down, so we don't have the opposite words. We have words like worry. There's no good word in our language that expresses the opposite of worry. We have a word like resentment, which uh, really says expressing a sentiment, expressing a feeling, re-expressing it, but it's become only to mean something negative. So our language is limited, but it's very powerful. Uh, language is what introduced us to spirituality, uh, but it's a negative kind of thing. It's, it's you know, uh, our animals were only interested in enough, but we're interested, we've got to have greed, we've got to have much more than enough. So the words we use is very important. So we forget how powerful if we continue to use words that are put downs and are negative that's why we get ourselves into difficulty uh it's it's that easy to do it's hard to believe that if you actually practice substituting these words we change our behavior words what what's what's so powerful is the symbols we use are so powerful that they are signals that turn on emotion and unfortunately as i mentioned this the symbols we learn earlier basically teach us this uh, new disease, uh, which I call either-or addiction. Addiction is a very powerful disease because most people who are addicted believe that they are right and the people who tell them that they are addicted to something uh, should mind their own business. They feel that unless they continue to do what they've been doing, then uh, then they're going to, uh, they will not be able to survive very well. So we get we get caught up in our ideas. Uh, that's the that's the beginning of this hopeless helpless response. It's like a, the example: if you take an elephant, a baby elephant, and you tie him down with a stake, uh, he grows up, and when he gets to be a big elephant, he could easily pull that stake out. But he's learned that that the stake is to hold him there, and he doesn't run away. And that's the kind of attitude we get. We 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 think that. If we follow what we're taught in terms of our early patriotic and religious and and, and political beliefs, that that's the right way. Uh, it's very difficult to change ideas once we've had them. Think about it. The people who have done something new, like just changing our words and, and practicing and really trying it and seeing that it works, the people mm-hmm. who have done something new, whether it's Jesus or Moses or whether it was uh, Copernicus or or Darwin, uh, or uh, Ayer de Chenin, all of these people who had creative ideas were punished. They were severely rejected. It wasn't until well after their death that people began to accept some of their ideas. So something new like this, uh, which is different than, you know, as long as we continue this disease, of, which is, a, I think, a collective insanity that we have, either or disease, uh, that's one of the yeah. reasons we're stuck. Thank you, Don. This is Bob, and uh, really, really appreciate you uh, spending your time uh, developing all of this. 
over the course of time, but also developing it in, in presenting it to us this evening. And one of the things I see, and, and first off, I'm, I'm going to open the mic here momentarily and invite everyone to participate in the discussion, questions and discussion. Um, but one of the things that I see so powerful here is, the, uh, is this uh, power of words. And I, as, as I was looking at some of the notes as I was writing them down, I thought, uh, how is this different than affirmations or not? Because there's certainly uh, two school seems to be at least two schools of uh, two, two camps of thought about the uh, value and the power of affirmations. But in this case, this is not really that. It this word switch, uh, and then we're hearing ourselves use different words and it provides the opportunity. So much has been written by so many great authors and thinkers about uh, the power of the words and the power, therefore, the power of thought and then the, uh, with intention, different actions. And so I really uh, I have a new appreciation for the significance of this word power, these word shift to, um, for us to integrate for ourselves. So thank you for that. The idea of the words are that we need to, we need to transfer the intentions of our animal brain which are mostly material and physical, to our conceptual human brain. Our human brain can solve puzzles because of words. Words are signals. Think how people get so emotional when they, when they see a particular flag or a religious symbol. But it's because we've been trained that way for years from the time we're grown up. We're taught to pledge allegiance and owe, and, and owe allegiance to a particular symbol, which is a symbol that divides us into two categories. And it's the new words that we have to invent. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've done will, will be in my book is a new symbol that teaches us a universal symbol rather than one that separates us. Okay. Don, what is, what is the name of your new book? I'm going to call it the uh, 7 plus 2, uh, either 7 plus 2 formula equals happiness, love, and peace. I was thinking of calling it the new story of us because uh, the new story of us is really the story of evolution. Uh, finally, we have a scientific basis for the golden rule. Uh, this is one of the important, I think, points that we've been looking in spirituality to find a scientific evidence to verify it, and now we have it in evolution. If you, what what, what uh, Darwin has taught us, we're just beginning to wise up to it, that in order to go from a single cell to 50 trillion cells, which has happened over three and a half billion years, in order for that to happen, we had to go to more complex forms, from a single cell to multiple cells mm -hmm. to two sexes and so on. And each time we've gone to the next level, there's one principle that we can identify, and that's called reciprocity. Those cells, individual cells that contributed to the larger complex system led to survival. Those cells that took but did not give became cancer cells. They're like cancer cells they take, and then the organism would die, and then the cancer cell would die. And that's what's happening in our society today, unless we can learn to cooperate with one another and realize mm -hmm. we've got to develop reciprocity. And what are the words that we use to express the principle of reciprocity? Reciprocity, the words we use in human language, are the golden rule. So here we have a scientific validation of that the golden rule is going to be essential to learn to show reciprocity if we're going to survive in this world. Okay. All right. If anyone would like to um, address Don, um, just uh, you can speak up and I'll just call on you. And if anyone has any questions for Don or comments? I have more, but I just don't want to... Uh, so, let's see. This is Tsunama. Um, Can you hear me? Hi, Tsunama. Can you hear me? Hi. Mama? Wonderful. Hi, Tsunama. I have, I have thoroughly enjoyed every spoken word. And um, it's like a crystal clear visual of of restructuring, reprogramming the collective consciousness simply by choosing, mindfully choosing these words. It's very powerful. I 
I just so appreciate your place within the collective and and the gifts and the tools that you're bringing to all of us through this work, uh, Dawn. I, I just am filled in my heart with appreciation for you. Well, thank mm. you, and I pre- appreciate uh, your comments as well, Danama. And uh, just as a suggestion here, anyone can become a love creation teacher by three simple steps. If you go to the website lovingmenow.org or to the 7 plus 2 formula.org, you will easily learn these simple skills. Then if you take the second step of passing it on to a next person, the next person, and in my experience, will call back and say thank you. When they call back and say thank you, just say, if you like what you just read, why don't you pass it on to some of your friends? So you see, by the domino effect, we could rapidly create millions of love creation teachers. Anyone can become a love creation teacher. It doesn't cost any money, and it's such a simple thing to do, and it's fun to do. It's fun to learn to love yourself so that you can pass it on to others. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, anyone else like to address the, our guest, uh, Dr. Don Pett? The mic is open. Okay, I don't hear anyone right now, but um, Don, I, you know, I'm going to be a little, uh, not contrary, but I'm going to say, you know, if language is so powerful, you know, um, can you have love? Can you have peace without language? Uh, I think biologically we are created to uh, to, to uh, deal with the world in terms of either or. I think it's instinctually within us to uh, attach ourselves to a group. We see that in every species; they become part of a group, and they show. And each member of the group shows allegiance to their group, and then that group begins to engage in confrontations with other groups. That's, that's the history of our world, and we see that in virtually every group. So I, I don't think uh, what makes us unique, what makes human beings unique is that we have the ability to engage in conceptual uh, thinking. Words are our ability to use imagination. Einstein told us the most powerful force uh, besides possibly love is imagination. It's because we can anticipate the past and the future and think in terms of concepts. We can think in terms of uh, doing good for other people. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, when uh, when we see the ants, the red ants attacking the black ants and so on, uh, most of that is programmed into, I think, our, we're, we're pretty biologically reactive organisms. Human beings are unique because we are the only we are the only species that has the ability to direct our energy to change ourselves, to, to, uh, to engage in real spirituality. That's We are spiritual beings. Uh, all organ, any, any life creates energy, but we are the only, in, we're the only species that has developed language, and language enables us to anticipate the future and, and, and anticipate such things as the golden rule is love and forgiveness compassion, uh, and so on. So I think the answer to that is, I, I think we're, we're basically designed to be warlike animals, or warlike creatures, and we're discovering that we are evolving to the next level, which is becoming what I like to call humane becomings. I love that combination of words that are not in our language. Humane, mm-hmm. you know what humane means. It's what humanity is all right. about, love, forgiveness, and so on. And mm-hmm. we're humane becoming. Okay. We're on the well, process Don, you know, the other, uh, the other week when Bob and I were up here in Connecticut, we had a wonderful time with you. And uh, I'm going to ask you one of the uh, same questions I asked you at dinner that night. It's like, where does the heart fit into all of this? Because, you know, I've just been reading a lot of the Heart Math uh, Institute's research, and they've been researching consciousness related to heart rate variability and other things. And, you know, since the 70s, and they have very powerful findings, um, you know, for, you know, the, the heart, that the electrical field is greater than the brain, uh, that it, there's more signals going from the heart to the brain than vice versa, 
And so far, I really haven't heard anything about um, uh, heart in, in what you're talking about. And so, you know, I don't know if that's because, you know, you're just, you know, designing a, a formula and, and um, you know, that's why. But so just, if you would just kind of speak to that, that would, I would appreciate that. Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. I actually appreciate the question. Well, again, as a person who's been interested in evolution, uh, the the brain, the cor- especially the human part of the brain, the cortex, has in the last two million years has grown in size 350 percent, from a little over a pound to about three and a half pounds, and it is a very very complex organism. When I was in medical school, we were told our brain had a hundred million cells. More recently, we talk about how many billion cells are in the brain. So the brain is the only organ that can deal with conceptual reality and do planning and so on. You know, as a, as a, as a physician, you know, we've dissected with the, the body, and the heart is the most magnificent organ. It's a pump. And a pump, you know, makes a lot of noise. It just makes a lot of electrical discharge. It's, it's very noisy, you know. It's easy to listen to. You can't listen to your brain working very well. So from my point of view, the brain is the most efficient and the most recently developed organ. The heart, uh, and and roughly the same size, is found in virtually all animals. You know, uh, so there hasn't been that much change in the heart for for, for billions of years, or not for billions of years, but probably, you know, the dinosaurs had big hearts. Uh, But they, they weren't able to deal with the kind of things that the human brain can deal with. So I respect the heart. It's a marvelous organ. It, it pumps millions of times and, and puts bullet around the body. We couldn't survive without it. But I think we've mistaken the idea of heart. The heart means the center of things, the most important thing. And, and I guess uh, I, I know it may be disappointing to, uh, in some ways, but to me the heart has been a, mag- a magnificent pump that we see in many animals and so on. But we are, we are unique by our ability to to use concepts and to gauge in, in really love and so on. The, the heart that we create, that we put in our Valentine's Day, is not what the heart looks like. Uh, that's sort of a <laughs> you know fictitious kind of a thing. But and I think it's symbolic for it's really symbolic for for love and forgiveness and the kind of things we think of as humanity. Uh, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, just because the heart makes a lot of noise and you get a lot of electrical discharge and so on, it's just like a pump. You know, the pump makes a lot of noise, any pump, but uh, it doesn't do what the brain does, and, it, and the brain does it very quietly. Well, I tell you what, my monkey mind is not quiet. So <laughs> I'm just gonna, I want to jump in gonna, here. Go ahead, go ahead, Jill. Hi, this is Linda. Um, oh, Linda, I'm sorry, uh, Linda, go ahead. Okay, so I just, uh, first of all, Donna, I love it. Uh, I I think it's great stuff, and I really uh, appreciate you saying that we can incorporate it into work that we're doing because I'm also reading a book right now. Um, And and so I just have to throw out a really alternate perspective, and that is that for as long as we're talking about our bodies, and third dimensional stuff, we're going to stay in the third dimension. And I believe the transition that we're faced with in the oneness, mindfulness movement is to learn how to move from this third dimensional place. Because I don't believe that we're, we're here to be as miserable as we've become. And the lesson is to to remember, I know everybody talks about an evolution, but in in my world, what we really need to do is reconnect with our source. We're light beings, and we need to find our way back to that, which is not an evolutionary process. It's really a... uh, unless it's a coming back around in a circular fashion. In that case, it would be uh, to connect back up uh, to our origin. So, so if we can take the things that Don is bringing forth and then apply them at that energetic level, 
where we're really living as our light beings, then we're really going to see some progress. Thank you. I'm complete. Uh, Linda, uh, thank you for that comment. You know, there are many ways to get to the top of the mountain, and we need to find all the ways that we can. And actually, I don't think we're, we're, we're really that much difference of opinion. The first sill, the first sill had two properties. The one property was to reproduce itself. It had an impulse to produce more cells. And the second that we've seen in the first cell that's continued throughout is to evolve to higher levels of complexity. And I think what you're describing is this new dimension is something invisible. That's the spiritual values, you know, love and forgiveness and so on. These are things we're, we're kind of discovering now. You know, it was only 2,500 years or so ago that we invented the golden rule. You know, and, and the people who invented it, uh, who brought the golden rule into the world, were pretty much punished. They were, you know, the, it was kind of a uh, a very uh, uh, antagonistic to the general thought of survival of the fittest and might is right. So we are evolving to higher levels, and I think what you're describing is a new dimension of something that just because it's not physical, it's it's invisible. It is another dimension, and that's where we have to move to that higher level of spirituality. Yes, exactly. I think I, exactly, yes. Yeah, I really appreciate your comment, Linda, uh, this is well, um, because um, uh, I'm, I was just kind of feeling like I've, everything was so biology-based. And I'm thinking like, you know, I really don't consider myself just this physical being. In fact, I think that's the, the very smallest part of me. I think I'm as, of myself as a multidimensional spiritual being. And um, so sometimes, you know, although all my background has been, uh, you know, electrophysiology of the, of the human body, uh, I, I just don't think of myself that way because, um, you know, the point that you were bringing, Linda, if we're still thinking of ourselves as 3D, we'll stay in 3D. So I'm, I'm think I'm like, okay, let's do, let's do 15D or something. <laughs> <laughs> Go for the stars. Exactly. Why not? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But thank you for that comment, and thank you, Don, for yeah. There are many you know, it's many ways uh, up the mountain that's really a, a good, and that's, that's kind of how, you know, I look at spirituality. It's like I don't care what you practice, it's, you know, what you, um, what religion you call yourself. It's how you treat your fellow man, like the golden rule. But um, would anyone else like to jump in here with some comments for, for Don? Hey, Noelle, this is Shelley. Hey, hey, Shell. Come on in and hey. join uh, <laughs> I just am really delighted by what uh, this very evocative conversation, and um, you know, I really appreciate Don. Um, you know, he's sharing some <clears throat> very substantiated um, ideas and practices, and. Here he is, and he shows up on the Heart Resonance call for three years every Monday. And and we joke as the token mail, but that's only if Bob doesn't show up. And, um, you know, I guess it's just, I just feel like there's so much here. And what comes to mind for me is, you know, the ancients, the ancestors, um, they always talked about we are the sum of everything that has come before and that's inclusive of our relationship to the stars, our our experience of light. They understood, you know, you go all the way back and, and they they actually had a particular understanding of the relationship between being on earth and um and the stars and the galaxies and it it was inclusive of everything and I just feel like if we can expand ourselves to understand that we are like we're whole on with it, we're whole within the whole and each individual brings forth their unique expression. And um, in my world, I mean, I, 
I'm very clear. I mean, when I was like, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, I knew I was here uh, uh, focused, you know, as a being here to speak about love and truth. And um, and in my journey, I, I ended up like really going the way of the heart. I mean, I remember even having a boyfriend and his whole thing was about money and my whole thing was about love. And, and in that way, what Don's speaking about fits. And I, and I also go back and I hear so much about the heart-mind, the relationship between the heart and the mind, um, as well as for 15 years taught about, you know, I mean, we used heart math as uh, a resource for, for the, you know, the trainings that we taught called Mastery of the Heart. And um, I just feel that what, you know, it's all valid. And I think that's some place that we need to really expand ourselves, that it's all valid, especially when that passion and expression is showing itself. And, you know, this piece about the golden rule, um, I remember growing up and my father was the one who always said, you know, um, you know, put yourself in someone else's shoes and then respond from there, essentially the golden rule. And um, I, I'm just really pleased with the conversation tonight with the dialogue. And um, I know that even at times I've struggled with um, the mindfulness of, you know, of Dawn because um, it's very challenging for me to, to, you know, come into grips with some of the things. But what I love is what's really evolved, and I do feel like, it's, you know, it's about evolution where we're evolving into more complex beings at the same time where there's something that's being simplified because in order to have peace, in order to have love, um, it's a real, um, it's a simple process. And I love that you know, Don's addressing things that so many of the mainstream people can understand and through that pathway they can grow into a greater understanding of what you're talking about, um, you know, that multidimensional self. And I think we're evolving each other. And so I just, I'm really grateful for this call tonight. Um, I think it's been a lot of fun and a lot of thought-provoking things, um, and I think Don's really found a way to approach the mainstream in a way that um, they can really experience love as a practical experience, and that can change their lives. So I'm complete. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Shelley. And, you know, thinking about it, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's a very useful, extremely valuable set of tools that you've given us, Don. And, uh, you know, if I just ask myself the question, well, if everyone adopted all these and did all these, yeah, I think we'd have a pretty darn peaceful world. <laughs> you know? And I think that's what uh, uh, our peace doctor, is, um, his goal is. So I think that, you know, goes towards it very well. So um, I think that... Uh, uh, Don, do you have any comments uh, that you want to comment back to Shelley or well, uh, anything? Well, first of all, I thank Shelley, and I think Shelley, uh, Shelley has. I just want to acknowledge Shelley's done a brilliant job with this with this group and keeping people together and coming up with ideas every week. And uh, so I know she's on the track and is, is really energetic and passionate about what she's saying. And I, I think you, but you deserve. Uh, Bob and, and Noel for what you've been doing. People don't know that you gave up your, your flying your careers. You were both pilots, and you, you gave up your residence, and you bought a van and traveled every state in the country, didn't you, to, to pass on your <laughs> spiritual message. So uh, I have a great deal of respect for what you've done. I, I don't know of anyone who's, who's done what you've done. So uh, I think that's terrific. But I would like to leave the group here with just a final thought, and that's just mm -hmm. following uh, we have become addicted as a as a as a world as a pop, global population to either or thinking. It is a major disease. We do mm -hmm. tend to think in terms mm -hmm. of these two categories, us and them. And it's been going on from it started when we were programmed 
nine months before we were born biologically, and it continued when we were given our symbols, our various symbols that divide the world into different categories. So the simple message is, if you practice these seven simple words, they're not going to change things in a couple times. If you practice it regularly for 30 days, I will virtually guarantee you that it will change your way of thinking and change your life. But it's like trying to cut a path through the jungle. You know, if you just cut a path and then you don't do anything, it's very quick that the rest of the jungle grows right back and the path is no more. So if you're going to change things to really learn to uh, take responsibility for loving ourselves with the abundance that overflows, then you've got to practice this regularly. But in 30 days, it will become effortless and automatic. I've seen it happen so many times. And it, people just feel so great when they get to that stage. And then they want to go ahead and, and, and pass this on to other people. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you for your generous spirit uh, that you've always shared everything and made it so available to us. I can remember even bringing us flash drives at some of our retreats and sharing it with us. And uh, mm-hmm. Don, do you want to give us um, your, uh, if someone wants to contact you by email, I'm, I'm going to think that, you know, you can contact Don through his website, lovingmenow.org. I know you have several, but with the, are they all linked? If they went to that one, would they be able to find the other one? Well, I'm, I'm surprised that you weren't able to find the 7 plus 2 formula because uh, I've... Uh, I've been able to get it here, but uh, my website is, uh, my contact is ddped. Uh, it's very simple, D, D like Donald Duck, two Ds, and then pet, P-E-T, at comcast.net, ddped at comcast.net. Uh, Noel and Don, uh, may I ask that, um, can all of this be put on the Facebook page, all the adre- all the addresses? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's great idea. Okay, Joe, that was a great idea. Yeah, that would be that. wonderful. Thank you. Okay, okay super. Okay. We'll do that. And, uh, of course, the call will be um, posted momentarily and will also be on our website, cocreatorsconvergence.com, where we have, Bob has been archiving all the calls for the last um, couple of years. And, um Don, it has been a pleasure. It was so much fun getting together with you. Don came out to our Pachamama Symposium that we did up there and drove a couple hours each way to come and uh, hang out with us, and we really enjoyed our time, Don. I'm glad we finally got to have this call together. It's been on both of our lists for quite a while. So thank you, Don, so much. Yeah, we really pleasure. appreciate thank it. Thank you. What a close thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Don. It was, uh, as Noel said, it was a delight to spend the evening with you as well as the day um, up there in Stanford. We appreciate you putting in the the extra miles in New England traffic to do that. So um, uh, just a joy. And this evening's conversation, wonderful, as many of you have said, wonderful and helpful perspective, incredible tools for us to use. And, And I really appreciate, Don, you know, your suggestion uh, your offer to just uh, that we take these things and use them in our daily lives, use them in the in the work that each of us are doing in the world, and um, and and then through the support of both here within the convergence community, and uh, many of us have other um, uh, intersecting circles of involvement in different places to, for us to be able to carry this message of yours and uh, referral to your uh, to your work, your passion. Uh, out into the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone for being with us.